Brought to you by Newgrains. Hello and welcome to the first episode of Midlife Moments. I'm here with Todd Richards. Hi, I'm over here. And our guest today is Mr. Troy Ecker. Troy, did I pronounce your last name right? Spot on. Spot on. Troy, you were one of the first, or you were the first employee of Volcom, is that correct? That's correct. But I don't want to jump right into that. First, I want to know, <laughs> where's Troy from? Where were you born? I was born in San Diego. San Diego? Yeah. Nice. Was. Awesome. Yeah. And then did you stay in San Diego or? No, pretty quickly moved up to uh, Northern California. Okay. Kind of San Francisco zone. Oh, that's hella cool. <clears throat> Super hella cool. Santa Rosa, San Jose, and then uh, ended up down at Lake Forest. So you're moving around a lot. Was that mom and dad with work or? Yeah, mom and dad with work, just bouncing all over the place. Okay, yeah. so end up in Lake Forest. Mm -hmm. And were you skating at this time? No, I wasn't skating. I wasn't, I don't even know what the hell I was doing. But uh, I, was, I was dreaming about surfing, apparently, so I yeah. water at some point. So what did you think about surfing before you ever surfed? Did you think it was cool? Did you know you wanted to be a surfer? I don't even remember how I got introduced to it. Probably magazines and whatnot. Tom Curran was probably the first person I was definitely gravitating towards. Yeah. And that was even before I was surfing, I think. Mm -hmm. Super young, like 10 years old. Yeah. And... Um, yeah, just uh, somehow made it to Doheny with my mom. And Ooh, was boogie boarding at Doheny. That's the perfect spot if you're if you're gonna start off. Go to Doheny. So Let's fast forward to River Jetties. When did you become a River <laughs> Jetties master? When did that happen? Never River Jetties master. Okay, where? Okay, you you were always synonymous with Noops. Fifty fourth Street. The Noops crew. Fifty between Forty Seventh Street and Fifty No Fifty Second Street Jetty and Fifty Sixth Street. That was the stomping ground. And what was like? What year was that? Yeah. I mean, that was probably, I moved to Newport in 90, so it started about 1990. Now, at this point, it was, was Danny Quack, he was the Quicksilver TM. He did, did you ride for Quick? I did. You I did for Quicksilver, for... yep. Did I you did. wear the Echo Beat shorts? I don't remember. Oh, I, don't know. <laughs> I still wear them around the house. I don't know what yeah. I was wearing. You were just rocking it? Yep. Living there? Okay, mm -hmm. so Newport, 1990. Newport. Yep. And you start surfing a lot more. How old are you when you first get sponsored? Um, I think I was like 16. 16 years yeah, old. 15, 16, something. Maybe younger, actually. I read for Town & Country, Thriller Gorilla. Remember Thriller Yeah, Gorilla? absolutely. That was when they were doing all those amazing graphics. So I read for Town & Country before uh, Quicksilver, and I was super obsessed with Matt Archibald when all the guys had the big TNC logo on their absolutely. boards. And then they, so they had TNC, and then they had like another sponsor, like Gotcha and TNC. And um, yeah, somehow I got the TNC. Was so awesome. was there plans, like... Once you start competing, winning contests, are you thinking, I'm going to be a pro surfer, I'm going to go to college, or I want to go into the surf industry? Any of that? I didn't know what the fuck I was going to do. Day by day. You're yeah. Just... I was 18 and just like smoking a ton ton of weed and just like just I've been listening there, to metal music. I don't I've been know there. what I was doing. I currently have a pretty serious edible problem, <laughs> but that's either here or there. So you, you're surfing your brains out, your guts out, and when does Vulcan come around? So, Wooly, Richard Wolcott, was my, um, well, he was running the marketing at Quicksilver at the time, okay. and um, he quit, and basically started Volcom, and a few months later, he started with Tucker Hall, a few months later, he hit me up, and he was just, he was like, hey, I'm starting this company, I have no idea what it's going to do or be or anything, but do you want to be a part of it? And, and why do you think he chose you? I have no idea. Come on, you've had, you got to have some, Probably. out of all the people he could have called, he calls Troy. Yeah. I don't know, I was like a local surf rap kid in Newport, mm -hmm. and so to maybe claim stake in kind of the hood down there, maybe was part of it, for sure was part of it. So he knew you were in with the local crew yeah. already kind of, it's pretty smart. And was he living in El Moro at the time? No, this is pre-El Moro. He, pre he was in Newport Shores, he was down okay. there, in, down in the zone. And so at this point, like, you know, you got Volcom shows up in the scene, which is like the anti Quicksilver. Because everything is like all like super corporate. And then. I think Todd, doesn't Todd ride for Quicksilver? I do. That's weird. I do. But this is, okay. it's a very incestual thing because, you know, we got. Uh, not only has Richard come from, from, you know, Quick, but also Danny Kwok. True. From Quick, investor in Volcom. Is that true? Mm -hmm. How's, like,. Give us the incestor. I've, I've heard <laughs> oh, millions of stories about how Quick is somehow involved with Volcom. Like, how, what was the the tendrils of that? All those things know? you signed back in the day, that's all expired. <laughs> yeah. all it's been like seven past. years, right? So. Statue of limitations is over. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, yeah, DK was an early investor in Volcom. For yeah. sure, he was definitely mood lighting, but it's no secret. So. Double dipping, hey, that's the way you make it money. Was a smart, it was a smart double dip on his part, financially. For sure. Yeah. For sure. So were you going into stores like when Volcom first started as her first employee, like Laguna Surf and Sport? Are you going checking out how it actually looks? Are you approving product or? Yeah, it was all hands on deck at that point. I was doing like shipping like the second half of the day and marketing right. and team, the first production, retail, like all kinds of different Are you like going up to work and being like, this kid's insane, he should be on Volcom. I surfed with this guy, He's he would fit the brand. Like, Yeah, yeah, that was definitely part of it, was like just keeping our finger on the pulse of Newport and just kind yeah. of starting in our backyard and staking a bit of claim there and finding a few kids. And we were, I mean, the skateboard thing was part of it too, so we were like picking up skateboarders and just like a lot of local kids in the beginning. Yeah. yeah. So what do you think about people that get Volcom Stone tattoos? Because <laughs> <laughs> I've been in the Inland Empire and there's a lot of ladies with they're, them and a lot of dudes with them. It's crazy. You know, it's, I, tr I remember, I remember getting like mail or letters with photos, like yes. literally coming in with like stone tattoos and we're just like, holy shit, this is actually happening. Like this is, this is insane. Who so designed cool. the stone? Yeah. Is it from that freaking rock that's in a, uh, what is it? It's, the end of Subject Hawkinson, you'd see freaking mm. Wooly walking yeah. around some rock. Like, yeah. is it like, what is it? <clears throat> so it's the inside of a diamond upside down, basically, is what it is. Oh, and that's some trippy shit, man. Tom McElroy was the one that designed <laughs> the stone, and it was like, you know, smushed, and then they, he elongated it and made it into the stones. So. Yeah, it turned into something very, very iconic. Yeah. So you're with the brand for how many years? 20 years. 20 years. Yeah. And at some point, you're still getting photos in the mag in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Did you compete in the like surf, skate, snowboard competitions? Because I remember seeing your name. Like, did you win a couple of those? Yeah, it was, yeah. It was the surf snows. The surf Definitely snows. not skateboarding. It's all in one day, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was super fun. It was the H2O Winter Classic. Right. Bike, bike put that on and Bill Keller. I only did one of those and I remember it was so big at Huntington. <laughs> it was gigantic rip just and like you know all the surf turkeys were like laughing at the big like, dudes who just snowboarded a couple or surfed a couple times a year because we were just we we're going to die out there we're i think we we're at the end of the pier at one point i remember being in a heat with greg tomlinson gt and gt was like talking me down like it's going to be all right dude just like <laughs> get, it's pretty mushy out here just take off on one and i'm like it's just mountain stacked yeah. And I just remember being in the water being like, motherfucker, wait till tomorrow. Or whatever, like, you know. <laughs> Snowball yeah, snowboard all over your ass, dude. Yeah. That was, those were great events. So I fun. wish that those happened more. So yeah. They were great. They were. So eventually your role at Volcom, starting packing, doing all that. Mm -hmm. At the end of 20 years, where are you at? What's your title within the company? My title was Executive Vice President of Global Marketing was my title. Okay, and during this time, had you got married, had children? Yep, yep, family? all the above. All the above. Mm -hmm. And are you having a good work-life balance, or are you like the work guy? Oh, no, I was fucking grinding so grinding. hard. Yeah, I didn't know what was going on. I was just like 12-hour days, 14-hour days, like living, eating, breathing work, basically. Yeah. See, that's a weird thing, like with a company like Volcom or like with, with any brand that is a lifestyle brand, there's no detaching from it, no. I don't think. It's like, mm. you know, even when you're around your bros, it's always like someone's trying to work an angle or you're trying to work an angle, and that's like, you know, how do, like, how do you even deal with that? Like, I know from coming from an athlete's standpoint of that is one thing, but like actually being responsible for people's, you know, well-being, like, you know, you, you've got to grow this company because you've got all these other mouths to feed that you kind of feel responsible for. Yeah. Is it like, what's that like on the psyche as far as... Yeah, it was a lot of pressure, man. It was, it, it luckily, um, it, I was so young, kind of coming up into it. it. Was I literally grew up into it, and I obviously worked my ass off and evolved and challenged myself. And you know, Wooly being my mentor was just incredible, pushing me along the way. But it was there. Were, it was stressful, man. There was there it was fucking challenging for sure. And you know, it was there's shareholders and then especially when we went public it was like the whole public thing and that was crazy and a whole nother level of pressure to perform and stay cool and you know it was, it was, it was pretty wild how long did it take okay so once this is kind of jumping around a, a bit but like once it went public 
How soon after that did you make your exit from Bolt? So I went public in 2005 and I left in officially from my position in 2010. Because of you were just over it or because that was always your plan was to phase yourself out? It was kind of a plan to be there 20 years in my mind from pretty early on. Probably 10 years in, it was like I could do another 10 years here. Right. So it was like, it was kind of the 20 year plan essentially. And it worked out just because at the end I was just getting burned out on being a manager, honestly, mm -hmm. and not being as creative as I was and just felt like my time was up basically. Yeah. So did you have any plan on how to transition out of this surf industry where you've been a part of this company that's gone public, you've been there 20 years, you have the skill set that you've developed from meeting all these different people. Did you have any idea when you left Volcom what you were going to do next, the next phase of your life? No, and I didn't care. Didn't care? No. I love that. I was done. I like was I'm just going like, surfing? I needed to go surfing. Yeah. yeah, I moved to Kauai in 2010 and I had... Basically, Richard and I created a position where um, I was in charge of the marketing, like a Hawaii kind of marketing position, sort of like to, the end goal is to phase out, but to like kind of slowly, smoothly phase out and okay. still be involved. And 2011 is really when I officially kind of split with the company. But um, So it snipped, like it's not, nothing to do with the brand at all. In zero. Any form it's been much. 10 years since zero. Because I was kind of like, I'm kind of coming up in the surf world. <laughs> I know people and still. I, I mean, like shirts, <laughs> like I, I've always well, been yeah. down for the stone. Here's the, here's the craziest <laughs> thing. And I, it, this is like a joke that, I, you know, I joke, I've known you forever. I've, yeah. Like people within Volcom I've known forever. So at some point, you know, you've got a brand that's youth against establishment. Mm -hmm. That's the slogan coming up. When Volcom suddenly becomes the establishment. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's got to like, I've helped to incubate brands too. And it's like at some point when you're detached, but you never really leave it. Yeah. You know, your part of your soul is always there. Was it like, how does it feel now to kind of see like what Volcom is now compared to what it was like in its heyday, what we all saw, the grittiness of it. Is it yeah. like, is it weird? It's a trip. It's a total trip, yeah. It's it's it's. I'm I'm stoked that it's still alive and and going and thriving mm -hmm. in, in its own new form, and um, I mean it's been thirty years. It's like that's yeah. amazing. So, part of me is like hell yeah, and the other part of me is like you know, just it, it's it's an, it's gone in a different direction, mm -hmm. which you know for me as being part of that super core freaking crazy time is just. It's just sometimes it's interesting to watch and you know from afar. So I think it's fascinating yeah. to watch from afar, and it I is. think you take a lot of wisdom from that experience. Yeah. I can't imagine what it's like being in a shareholders meeting, <laughs> and you went from the dude at Laguna Surf and Sport like, "Here's your shirts," you know. Mm -hmm. So through that experience, you're doing something new now. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what you've been up to yeah. in this last phase of your life and career? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, been, a lot. it's been a wild one, man. It's been a roller coaster, honestly. I mean, I got divorced about eight or nine years ago now. Nine? I don't even know. Eight or nine. And uh, that was that was pretty wild on me and challenging. And, you know, I kind of just went into a bit of a, well, I was, I basically just went for self-destruction mode after, you know, the divorce. That's common that among men. Yeah, You're good right? at self-destruction. Like, yeah. like, be specific. Like, what was the Partying, stuff? just yeah. like just drowning my sorrows, you know, and just fucking just letting it all hang out basically yeah. for a solid six months, almost a year, you know, and I just turned 40 basically. And, um, are people around you letting you do that or is anyone trying to no stop one's you? No one's monitoring me at monitoring. all. <laughs> <laughs> You're a grown up. I was like the life of the party, like yeah. come over, like let's, let's fucking party, and rage, <laughs> you know? And, um, yeah, it was a throwback from like my mid days at Volcom, basically. Sure. When we were at trade shows, getting blitzed out of our minds, basically. I get whammy myself now, man. Yeah. I understand. So, so you're yeah. going through this, which is a massive change. Yeah. There's a lot of pain. Yeah. Sounds like you're drinking and partying yeah. a lot to maybe try to numb that. Completely. So, at what point do you realize oh, I got to do something else here? Yeah, it was it was a it was a solid you know year six months to a year after and. Um, I've had a yoga practice since 2006 and it was something that I got into because of all my injuries and whatnot. Any um, particular type that you do? Um, now I'm actually into hot yoga, hot which yoga. I never thought yeah. I would be, but it's really serving me right now. It's just a purification for me right now. But, um, 
Yeah, it was a uh, it was a it was a crazy time, wild ride, and I and I in in about three or four years ago, about four years ago now, um, I got into another relationship, which ended up being really just a rebound, total toxic kind mm. of relationship, and on both sides, and so that sort of set me into a pretty downward another downward spiral basically of just like fucking depression and just like not feeling fulfilled i got mold poisoning from the house i was living in what yes and i had all these like physical ailments basically oh come to the surface which was heavy and crazy because i've been pretty healthy my entire life and um and it just was like came out of kind of kind of out of nowhere and so that relationship dissolved and, and and i was in this point of just like what am i going to do with myself number one i need to heal like i don't even know what's happening to my body and so i just went down all these different rabbit holes of just different ways to sort of heal and be um get myself back to where i where i know i could be physically mentally energetically emotionally all those sorts of things and um so long story short i was going to therapy and it just wasn't like really doing all that much for me. Mm -hmm. um, and it's obviously a really great modality and it works really well for a lot of people. But for me, it just, I felt myself going in feeling like shit and leaving feeling worse basically. <laughs> and it was like my problems were just being regurgitated. So I was like, what else is out there? There's gotta be some sort of modality that, that I can like turn to because I'm like fucking, I need help right now. Like, I think that's time. Kind of, just to jump in, I think that's mm -hmm. really interesting too is like you think about you know, a lot of people that have shit going on or just stuff and it's like, you know, it's the, the easy answer is like, oh, we'll get you some therapy. But it just, it's like, it doesn't work for, some people are like straight up allergic to therapy. Mm -hmm. Like you said, it's like, all this is doing is making me mad at the person there, making me mad at myself. And then like, you know, you're throwing 200, $300 an hour in a fan and then leaving and being pissed. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's, I think it's okay to admit that therapy doesn't freaking work for everybody. It's not the band-aid, the psychological band-aid that maybe it's made out to be these days. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's so funny though that going to therapy made you realize all that. Right, I mean, totally. <laughs> like, like, I mean it, was a gift. it opened it's, up. It was a total gift. Like yeah. it was a gift for me to actually like look inward and be like, wow, this is not working for me. And I had all kinds of other shit going on too, just, um, you know, with like my health and whatnot. So, um, yeah, I just, I wound up on coaching, just, I was, and then all of a sudden I'm like, what the, f and it's been around for a long time, and I'm just like, what the fuck is this, this looks really cool, like, I, I'm, I'm interested, so I just, like, immerse myself with just, you, you mean life coaching, life coaching, mm -hmm. life yep. coaching as, as some, like, assistance for myself, like, right. to get me back to myself, and, and does someone recommend somebody to you at this point? I, like, went on this podcast, and just, mm -hmm. like, listened to all these coaches, and, and, and I found one in particular that was, like, that's my guy nice. and I reached out to him and he, he took me and, and I, I, I worked with him for two years and was that based on just a connection you felt with that yeah, person? Yeah, it was a full connection yeah. and, and it, it's cool because like in the coaching world, it's like there's no, there's no like rules and like you don't, you can basically share anything as a coach. Like you can share your experience where in therapy, the therapist is going to, they're not, mm -hmm. they're not allowed to share their experience basically. So it's a two person relationship yeah, as opposed it's a, to just this one sided. Completely. Yeah, I like that. So it's like, you're just like pulled into yeah. their experience and how it mirrors and relates to your experience and which really helps, helped me. And so from that point I was just like, I want to fucking do this. Like I, cool. this is what I want to do. And it ended up being pretty much kind of a throwback to what I was doing at Volcom minus all the partying, but you know, like, Taking care of athletes. Yeah, and, I can imagine yeah. talking a pro surfer off yeah. a roof, like well, it's, doing yeah. all that. Stuff. There's been a lot of talk about that lately. And just just since you know we just rolled through this Olympic thing and the, the whole Simone Biles yeah. and like where's your head at and mm. you know, I think within the the action sports industry and specifically because I, maybe they do it a little bit better in other industries, but there's not a lot that's not a lot of thought is given to like what if these kids don't make it. Totally. What does the other side look like? You know, you go from getting $7,000 a month, $10,000 a month of free money, and then it ends one day. Totally. And I was on, I was on that side of it at Volcom. We, were, we had to, to deliver that news multiple, multiple times. And I feel that we, we were super mindful and conscious of that at Volcom as far as like knowing that, okay, at the end of this year, this person is not going to be with us anymore. Mm -hmm. How do we tear this out? You know, and I think 
and, and I'm hoping we set a precedence there because we would tell them six months in advance, dude, you're, you're, we're not moving forward with you or you're gonna be cut X kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Just to give them some sort of preparation because to your point, it's, it's fucking cutthroat, you mm -hmm. know? And from, from that much money to zero is just, that's insane. Yeah. And, and a lot of them, that's all they know is to ride their surfboard, skateboard, snowboard, motorcycle, whatever it is. It's like all they know and they don't have any backup. So yeah, it's huge. And I'm actually working with two, two high pro profile athletes right now that are pretty much peaking and it's like the conversation is okay what's what's on the horizon for you basically like what what else is interesting you what are you looking at to get them thinking about it right now because a lot of these a lot of, I mean, you know mm -hmm. as an athlete you don't when you're fucking riding high you don't think about that shit yeah. you're just like i'm killing it you know not and, and eventually it's going to end yeah. so so how, how does it work? Are, did you have a mentor that kind of teaches you how to do this or do you just sort of learn as you go? I mean, for, for me, I, I immerse myself in books and just different things. I never took any official training. You don't need to like legally or anything like that. Anybody, anybody can be a coach. And, um, but it's, it's my life experience. I mean, like I right. said before, I've done it with Volcom with building like massive global employee teams and you know, helping people just basically move on and create other brands and businesses and things like that. So it was really just taken into like into my court and mm -hmm. kind of doing it for myself. So it's, yeah, it's been amazing and rewarding and I like love helping people. So yeah, you see, I can tell lot. when you're talking about it, that you're passionate about it and you get a lot of joy from it. Yeah. So would you say that experience of working with all those different types of personality types from all these different walks of life over the years has given you this playbook when you're speaking with people yeah you can talk and share your own experiences no doubt about yeah. it no doubt about it and it's cool it, it, it like i love to share like and before i i, I kept a lot of things really close you know right. and, and i think with this experience in the last few years of just like this hell shit and just realizing that like fuck i need to i need to enjoy my life and just be myself and if i feel i need to share share and it's really right. helped me and i love i love sharing with clients, you know, it's, it helps them, you know, it helps them sort of get on the same playing field of just knowing that like the adversity is, that's what it's all about. It's all about the adversity. So specifically, I'm always interested with men. Mm -hmm. A lot of us have a hard time being open totally. and sharing. There's this, those gates, those walls that maybe we learn from society or from our parents. Yeah. Do you find that it's difficult with guys to break through or? Yeah, for yeah. sure. For sure. But eventually they, they, they seem they, to they all they crack kind of at some up. point. The tears start coming. <laughs> Basically, it's yeah. just I mean, it's a lot of pent up energy when you're supposed to not share your feelings, you know. And and, and the energy it doesn't it doesn't leave the body. It stays in it you. It stays There's in issues you. Issues in your tissues, basically. You carry that stress, and it affects you at a health level. It can. It can, it can. fully manifest into physical symptoms, and I mean that that is disease. Yeah. Do you feel like it was that oh, was happening with you? Stress. Hundred percent. It was. It was stress that basically depleted my immune system to where the mold that was present in the house had the ability to manifest basically. And there was other shit that, you know, Candida and EBD as well. So Epstein-Barr, Candida and mold all at once basically. Mm -hmm. So it was like mm -hmm. a fucking cataclysmic disaster. And I'm still dealing with it. Like there's still remnants and residue, but it's just, wow. it's all good. So when we're like, in particular, coastal California, you have a lot of highly successful people. Yeah. It's about making money. It's about earning. It's about the game and all that stuff. You have seen what's in the game and mm -hmm. what success looks like. Yeah. And it seems to me what you're saying is that's not where all the joy lies and all the fulfillment lies. It sounds like when you start to be who you truly are, yeah. you're going to be a lot healthier and happier. I mean, that's been my experience. I've been, I've been through all that success shit and had the houses and right. the cars and the whole thing. I crashed the Porsche last week, so I know what's Didn't up. have a Porsche. I mean, my my Volvo was like the, the highest rolling It was a rental. Car. Anyways, <laughs> I like my truck. But um, yeah, man, it's, it's, it's about the moment and like all these things to go and get and have isn't gonna bring you. It doesn't. Bring you any. It doesn't. More happier than we are sitting on this red fucking awesome leather couch. Yeah, I 100% <laughs> agree. But is it hard to get a person to see that that's coming to you? Yeah. That's like so alpha, so driven, so success. Especially now with like, you know, with the parents and stuff and they have these kids that they, they see the pinnacle, they yeah. see what can happen. And then that, you know, you're like, I'm a life coach. And then, you know, they're like, well, 
You don't look very successful. Like, yeah, how are weird. you? How are you projecting success <laughs> into my child here? Like so, yeah. Like what? Like how does that kind of work out? You they, know? I mean, they only seem to show up when they're ready. Like you can't not. You have to be ready. You have to be open. You have to be broken. You have to be kind of broken open a little bit. Mm -hmm. right. You know, and ready to to do the work. Humble. You, yeah, you have you know. to be humbled in some way, whether it be losing your house or losing your job or losing whatever it is that adversity that's going to either wake you the fuck up or take you down, uh, you know, an even tougher trajectory. Right. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. So I, I am curious though, would you ever tell somebody, no, I'm not going to be your life coach? Definitely. I, you, I, good. All right. I, have, I was hoping you'd say that. Yeah, for sure. And there's, there's like, multiple people that I've just, they're either not ready and they think they are, or it's just not a right fit. Not I mean, the right fit. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. good to know. Yeah. So how long have you been officially been doing this? And what's the name of your company? It's called Radical Voyage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's just been like four years. It's just, it's new for me. Yeah. It's totally new, but it's not. It's like a life, this is a lifetime of experience that I'm kind of showing up with. Whatever, so for whatever that's the impression worth. I'm getting is you feel like you're doing what you would put on the search to do right now. Yeah. That's the vibe I get. A hundred percent. There's no question. It's, it's, yeah, absolutely. I think that's it feels good. the greatest thing. And if you can share that with other people, mm -hmm. like you need to be what you were put yeah. here to be. Totally. And uh, how still. old are you now? 48. Okay. So I had a very, my, my father-in-law has uh, given me wisdom over the years. Tells the same stories about 300 times. But the one <laughs> thing that I've taken from this is that he said that he didn't know shit until he was 50 years old. Mm. I was, I didn't know anything until I was 50. And I think that that's really an interesting thing, you know, from my life and from kind of listening to what you're saying is like all this crap that you carry around with you that causes all this ache and pain and disease and like you kind of, it, it takes you until like you're almost like midlife or towards the August, you know, the fall of your life to realize that none of that shit matters. And a person like you that can help shed that I mean, because I don't think you can do it by yourself. I don't, I don't think a person can just shed that layer. And it's like, my whole thing is why do it by yourself? If mm -hmm. you have the option to like partner up with somebody. Because we're freaking men. There you go. Yeah, you know? see, how that, see how that goes. Right. You know? No, you do need somebody to talk to. I, we were talking earlier about my dad's not, we are, I love him to death, but our communication, I wish there was more communication. Mm -hmm. I want to know you, dad. I want to hear what you have to say. I want to mm -hmm. say things to you but I don't feel like I can, mm -hmm. you know? So if you have a parent like that and you don't have anybody in your life that you can talk with and share these things, that maybe he's gonna be real honest with you mm -hmm. and call you on your bullshit. Mm -hmm. That's where I think life coach, if it's the right one, I yeah. think would fit in amazing. Because sometimes you just need somebody to point you in the right direction and mm -hmm. work through some shit. Totally. And like you said, therapy isn't for everybody. Um, it is for some, but and also like just mentorship. Like I think that mentorship. There's, there's, a, there's think a giant hole within just the youth. Totally. You know, yeah. it's like parents can only do so much, and there's just so much. Like with my, my kids, my son doesn't. I mean, it doesn't matter what I've lived through or what I know. They don't yeah. listen. It no. Doesn't it's matter. Dad saying <laughs> it. Whereas if Troy said it, it might be exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, that's true. Hello, my name is. Jonathan Wayne Freeman with the Midlife Health Minute. And I'm here today with a blind taste test of New Green Superfood and the other guys. Here we go. Uh, let's see, we'll start with this one. Oh my. <laughs> I don't. This makes me not want to be alive anymore. What is the name? Of the dear God in heaven is that stuff. What the Sam Hill? Oh, my tongue feels like it's, it's gonna die. Oh boy, I'm guessing that's not the new greens. Let's go ahead and see what's in this one. Oh yeah, that's my trusty mint. New green superfood. It's drowning out the flavor of the other guys. Terrible taste. To be perfectly honest, the only reason I'm standing here is because I used to drink this and now I drink this. This one, you can't even put in your mouth without wanting to vomit. New green superfood drink. 
the good stuff. Oh, I love it. Every single day, I just want to, I just want it all over. I just, I can't get it up of it. When you get out of bed every morning, mm -hmm. being where you are now, yeah. in this state of mind, state of life, what is a day in the life for Troy? Okay, well, typically wake up around 5.30 or 6, and I do reach for my device only to look at the ocean, um, look at Surfline, and then see what's going on, check around, just because my day revolves around the ocean. So once I kind of check on that, I'll just put it down, it stays down, um, I get up, I drink my lemon water, and then I go out and check the ocean. I go check beacons and just look at the ocean and kind of make, make my decision from there if I'm gonna go surfing, do yoga, journal. Typically, a lot of the time, <clears throat> it's interesting, I'm not like so much into the morning surfs lately, so I typically go back and um, I'll just bust out my yoga mat and I'll just start journaling. I'll do about probably 20 minutes of journaling just to kind of get my some thoughts on paper and, and uh, create some intention for the day. And then after that, um, I typically been going to yoga. I just go get on my get on my e bike and go to Yoga Tropics and go do some hot yoga. And then come back and maybe eat a little food, make a smoothie, make my green smoothie. And then hopefully get in the water. I'll go jump in the ocean mm -hmm. on my mid leg. Yes. <laughs> or my twin fin. Twin fins only for now. <laughs> Um, do a little beacons hustle or maybe even bolt up to lowers if lowers is good. Love lowers. And, and then I'll fit some work in there at some, some point during the day. <laughs> I, love, I love the way this day is sounding. I want to be Troy. It <laughs> sounds your, fantastic. Is your diet different? Like, I mean, like what's, what's a diet for you? Like, are so, you strict? Yeah, well, I, I did the vegan thing for about two and a half years. Wow. And then just recently I've kind of, I, I got back into fish. So... I'm really calling it intuitive eating and I, I, I really just check in and just kind of like feel into my body and feel what it needs in the moment yeah and and I usually go with that and um, but yeah very plant-based very heavy plant-based with uh, with some fish and mm -hmm. uh, no red meat no chicken uh, I actually just I actually did just have chicken when I was in Costa Rica. There's like this amazing rotisserie smokehouse chicken thing that I gave in. It's the first chicken I've had in like two and a half years. Had that really, protein taste. It was really yeah. fucking good. <laughs> May I share my diet with you? Please. In my previous life, I was a dolphin. So once a year, I have salmon just to satiate that dolphin <laughs> part of me. But I'm primarily vegan. <laughs> yeah. So, so amazing. Amazing. <laughs> what's your what's your diet like todd mine is um well we at our house and this is all credit goes to my wife because my brain just doesn't think this way is that you know we're it's very conscious about what comes in as far as like you know the sourcing of it and no gmos and that kind of thing um but i'm i don't eat a lot of meals i eat breakfast and then i pretty much don't eat all day and then i eat dinner mm. I don't drink. R rarely do I drink, I should say. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think I think chocolate's my <laughs> nemesis, you know. But that's like I'm not I'm not like really picky. Like you know, we we were very at our house. We were very gluten free for a long time because mm -hmm. the kids had some allergies and stuff like that. But it's we've tried a bunch of different diets and I don't know it's like you know you listen to your body my body's like let's go I'm hungry mm -hmm. what's there mm -hmm. you know I've never really put much energy into it yeah so seems for better or for worse I don't know seems to be working right I guess but I you know I think a body in motion needs to stay in motion because if yeah. you sit you know you you fall apart totally true yeah hey Troy I had a question too since I I'm 41 years old my T levels have been dropping and I've found that when I'm a young around like young women like in their 20s it makes me feel alive and not dead inside and uh, I'm just wondering if that's normal do you think my T levels are spiking when I'm around hot young chicks and not my wife and should I follow that instinct is what I'm saying can I cheat on her Troy? That, I mean maybe I'll discover a whole new path you know We'll talk yeah, about whatever, it. Whatever you feel, whatever you go feel. for it. It's good advice. Just <laughs> listen to your body. Troy's a good guy. Just go intuitive. Uh, just go intuitive on that one. All right, I like it. 
How can your body be wrong, right? It's not going to send you. Your body doesn't lie. It doesn't lie to you? No. That's actually my opening line. Like, our bodies ain't lying, girl. (laughs) Anyways, we learned a lot here today. What else you got? Uh, I got a lot of problems, Troy. A lot of problems. You know how people go on cocaine vendors? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I go on edible vendors. Okay. I go real deep, do a lot of self work. Yeah, how's that? My wife says I'm super selfish. I'm just like, it's. That's what I said. I'm doing the self work. And that means being selfish, you know, and I'm going on my journey. But I don't pick up or clean around the house or do dishes when I go on these journeys. Mm. So she thinks it's like not cool. Not cool. But again, follow the instinct, right? That's right. right. These edibles are out of this world. They're everywhere. Everyone just has them now. Neighbors give them to you. It's like, it's wild. Shreddables. But no, honestly, I have a lot of work to do, a lot of self work. And I think. What you're doing is awesome because I see you progress as a human being and you're continuing to grow and I need to do more of that. Mm. I mean, every, like, just coming from like everyone's different, everyone's got some crap they need to unload, Yeah. you know, mm-hmm. whether it be like, you know, you trying to figure out if it's okay not to do housework ever okay, yeah. <laughs> to like the ex-pro <laughs> who still has some weird thing in his head where he has to be competitive with the 17 year old for no freaking yeah. reason like it's there's why like, you no. so are there definitely some shady life coaches out there there's got to be right i'm sure there are or just I, some I mean, real piles of shit there has to be I, i'm sure there are yeah every industry has shadiness right for the Amen. Most part. that's the truth yeah. that's the truth what would you say at the end of the day would be the person who really could benefit from a life coach everybody everybody <laughs> everybody what age doesn't any matter any age any age so with your with your do you have a uh, two daughters i have three three do yeah. you coach them up no they don't want to hear from me ah, damn it it's like, what are we talking <laughs> todd richards is i think well yeah, i think it's, it's the true. way the way it goes dude they don't want you know nothing that sucks so man wish it wasn't like that <laughs> Well, it just, it seems to me that these days, that, you know, especially in light of where the world is in this crazy panic that we have, that there's a lot of people turning to alternate forms of um, emotional uh, solitude, you know, whether it be like someone looking at the bottom of a bottle of wine or someone like going, like feeding themselves on uh, news cycles or, you know, or life coaches. And there are, like you said, there's a lot of, you know, there's good good and bad and all these different things. So it's like, what, what are some, what's, I think that I know the answer to this, but I'd like to like, hear your thoughts on like, what, what do you look for in someone that you're looking for as a life coach? Like what, to you, what would be like, maybe a red flag and something that's, that's good to see? I think someone who, someone, I mean, I, through the podcast, it was great because I got to hear them speak about their experience, how they got into the profession, just who they are as a human being. And I think to know kind of about them and their, a bit of their past is really helpful. And that's what I love about the profession is you can share whatever the hell you want. And that's how I got introduced to his name is Richard Morgan was him you know, talking about how he, he was gonna commit suicide and how he was on his floor in his office with a gun in his mouth and just you know, how he basically bounced from that and had all these phobias around public speaking. and It was just like on and on and I'm just like, fuck, dude. I can, there's so much I can relate to. So I think it's just you know, being gravitated towards the coach is kind of, I don't, it's, hard, it, it's hard for me to actually explain how mm-hmm. How, um, how it worked for me to, but it was really just listening to him and just kind of just hearing about his life and how I felt he could help me. Like yeah. essentially I was like, dude, this guy can help me. It was like kind of that moment of like, he can help me, he's my guy. You know, so I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, I think that's, it's, it's pretty, you know, you have to have like a decent feeling about, about someone and like it has to resonate with you. You have to resonate. It's just, you know, like not everybody's gonna wa- wanna work with me, you know, mm-hmm. it's like, some people might want someone in a button-up tie or like mm-hmm. looking the you know the profession or whatever it's like i don't fit any fucking mold nor do i want to it's like this is who i am so if 
you resonate with my story and what I have done in my life or just what I'm all about, then let's have a conversation. And then in the conversation, we can get to the, to the crux of does this, you know, do you, do you, what do you need help with essentially? And, and can I help you mm -hmm. ultimately? And if I feel that I can and they feel that they want to work with me, then that's we strike up an engagement and whatnot. What's a red flag? Red flag. I mean, you're, you're savvy. You've been around the action. I, I, yeah. Usually, people that have been in this world, yeah. we can pick out red flags pretty Is easy. it crystals? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, crystals are, crystals are in. No. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to come up as judgmental by any means because there are some very smart, very ahead of their time people that are youthful. I think it's if just life experience is my in my perspective is something that I like. I wouldn't go hire a twenty-five year old coach, right. and that's just me being a little. I don't want to be you know. For me personally, as a forty-eight year old man, it's like I want to. I want to hire someone who has some fucking wounds yeah, seen, and some seen fucking some scars, shit. Yeah. dude, yeah. and, and a, you know, bounce through and is 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 owning their owning all of it, you know, and had some serious life experience and bounce back from like multitudes of adversity. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm looking for. So anybody that is like, hey, I took the course and got the license or got the certification. I'm a certified life coach. I went through the course. Like that's my experience. Mm -hmm. That's great, and there and, and there's so many people that can help people and do to you know hugely. But for me, uh, experience would be like a, like life experience is, is is a red flag for me. So that's great. So, and do you sign a confidentiality agreement with the person? Yeah, that's like um, I don't have any contracts or anything. It's just all verbal. I got a lot of secrets. So <laughs> yeah, they're right here. Love it. All right. That's code awesome. code of, verbal code of conduct. Mm -hmm. Verbal code of That's conduct. Because yeah. John's like at Area 51. <laughs> yeah. I go pretty far <laughs> off the res. You know? I don't know if you can say that anymore. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Well, this dude, you, this was awesome, man. And thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, thank you guys. I hope it was everything you dreamed it would be and more. And see, more. See you in the and more. And more. See it north. See it north. Peak. So. Well, it's truly been an honor having you over here, and thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me and Todd. Um, you've done so much in your life, and I think this next part is going to be the most exciting for you. I really mm -hmm. do, because you're, you're doing solid work among humans. You're not just putting a t-shirt on people, you're looking at their heart, and you're helping them make solid changes. So, thank you so much, yeah. dude. Thank you, man. That was our thank first episode. Yee! Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay. Thank you, Shrek. Brought to you by New Greens.